an Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 through 11. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first fruits of all the fruits of the ground which you harvest for your land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go out to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at the time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid us on us hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first fruits of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. Our sermon passage and a New Testament reading from Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Again, if you're visiting, an extra warm welcome to you. We're glad that you are here. One of the ways in which we can follow through and get to know you better is on the back side, there is a sign-up sheet, or not sign-up, but, and it tears off. It's really easy, and just put that in the offering box, which is in the back. So as we look at our text today, I want to ask uh, just like one introductory question, and it's this. What's the one thing that you want the most? And you might be thinking, heat. All right. Uh, <laughs> what's the one thing that you are willing to sell just to get it? Uh, today, we're in Matthew and not Mark. And though we're in a different gospel, it's the same theme. We're building a better kingdom because Jesus is building this better kingdom. Now, why are we looking at Matthew? We're looking at Matthew uh, because there's two very short parables regarding the kingdom of God that you cannot find anywhere else but here. We want to look at these kingdom parables because they're addressing something that's going on here at Cornerstone. Uh, as alluded in the prayer, um, you've noticed that our giving is down, substantially down, and so we're looking into reasons why that is. And as you would guess, the reasons are complex. Uh, some of us have had changes of income uh, some of us have actually moved away. Some of us are new and we're trying to figure out, is this church the place where we're going to stay? But one thing that is standing out is we're in a time of transition. And uh, during this time, we're coming up on about two years of not having a permanent lead pastor. And some are wondering, where is Cornerstone going? Is it worth investing in? Now, some of you at this point might be saying, great, this is going to be a money sermon. Um, not really. <laughs> it's actually going to be what I'm calling a kingdom sermon. The two parables here help us to remember what we are all about, not only as a church, but even as individuals. We are to be about Christ and his kingdom. And so these parables come and they teach us what it means to 
commit to Jesus as the king and his kingdom. And what we're going to see is Jesus is saying it's all or nothing. Also, we're turning to these two parables to help us to see the grace of God. And it's this grace of God that's not only going to fund like a budget deficit, it's this grace of God that's actually going to help us to seek a radical commitment to build the kingdom of God here in Waukesha County and even around the world. Now, some of you still might be thinking this is going to be a money sermon, <laughs> or others of you just want to check out. I'm encouraging you to stick around and let's dig in today because these two small parables are rich. What's our big idea? It's this. Uh, Jesus is our treasure, and because Jesus is our treasure, we are to seek his kingdom at all cost. Jesus is our treasure, and so let us seek his kingdom at all costs. We're going to have three points. We're going to talk about the centrality of the kingdom. We're going to talk about the cost of the kingdom. And then third, we'll look at the currency of the kingdom. Before we go further, would you please pray with me? God, we stop and pray because we need you. Oh, how we need thee. Every hour, we need thee. Holy Spirit, come and make my words clear, but also, Holy Spirit, come and open up ears and hearts. For these words of Jesus are tough. And so, Holy Spirit, lead us through this time that we would see our King, the King who gave all for us. Lord Jesus, be glorified. We pray in your name. Amen. So first, the centrality of the kingdom, and very simply, what are these two parables saying? Um, they're saying the kingdom of God is the thing that you are to want most. Again, the kingdom of God is the thing that you are to want most. And we need to you know, remember, what is a parable? A parable is a metaphor or a story that is making a point. And so these two parables, listen, are not a manual for business transactions. Instead, it's making a point that the kingdom of God is central to your entire life. In other words, your whole world is to revolve around this thing called the kingdom. What does that mean? The decisions that you make. Decisions like your job, marriage, do I get married? Who should I marry? Your kids, how do you raise them? Where to live and even things like spending your money is all in light of this thing called the kingdom of God. Also, it's your joys, your satisfactions. What are you looking to to make yourself ultimately happy? This kingdom affects that. But it also is your identity. You know what? Our identity is not primarily built around things such as my education, my salary, um, my nationality. Those are secondary and even tertiary. Here we're seeing that because of the kingdom, I belong to Jesus. He is my king. I am a citizen of his kingdom. I am what you call a Christian. Now, someone might be saying, how do you get that out of these two little parables? Let's take a step back and ask what's going on. In the first parable, one verse, we see a man and he finds a treasure in a field and then he goes and buys that field. Now, we want to be very quick. Um, this is not a fable. Um, money was not kept in banks back in ancient times because they didn't have banks. And so if you were a person of means or perhaps you inherited like gold, um, what you did with it is often you would hide it in a pot in a field. And what happens is Perhaps that person dies, or perhaps there is war and the person has to flee, or even there are no kids to give this to. And so sometimes this pot would be found in the field and there's money in it. Now, because this is ancient culture, you can't just take the pot out of the field. That's considered stealing, and so the people would not do it. And so instead, this man says, I must first buy the field in order to get the pot, to get the treasure that's inside. Now, in the second parable, it's, it's a little bit um, simpler. Here we find a merchant, and he's looking for the perfect pearl. And when he finds that perfect pearl, he sells so that he can then buy it. Now, what's striking about both accounts is what the person does to secure the desired item. Both sell 
everything that they have. Now, I just want you to consider that. That means that this is a person who sold all his assets. He sold his fields. He sold his livestock. He sold his home. Everything that he had, he sold to get this one thing. He did not do a second mortgage. He did not do a home equity loan. He did not go to his parents to get the money. He did not go to Cousin Vinny for that special loan. No offense if you have Cousin Vinny. Um, see, these parables are meant to have a shock value. And they shock us, but they particularly shock the original audience in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, the person would have been saying, what a foolish man. Who would sell everything? That is crazy to sell everything. We today would say that's a person who is obsessive. That is a person who has perhaps an uncontrolled desire. We might even say that's a person who's acting like an addict. I'm going to sell everything just to get one more hint. But Jesus is making a point. Do anything, even sell everything to get this kingdom, because the kingdom is central to you and your life. It is the most important thing in your life. So that's the centrality of the kingdom. Now, the second point, then, is the cost of the kingdom. And what we see is the kingdom costs all that you have, even your very life. Now, when we have passages like this where it comes along and says, hey, sell everything, what do we tend to do in a church? When we get a passage like this, we say stuff like this. Um, let's tone it down. Let's make it seem like it's something different. And so when we look at this passage, some might say, well, Jesus just, he's just saying, you know, here's a parable to show how important is the kingdom. Now, that's true, but it's not enough. What's he teaching? Jesus is teaching the kingdom is going to cost all because the kingdom is all your life. What he's saying is the centrality of the kingdom, it doesn't mean that just part of your life is under its rule. Listen. What he's saying is the kingdom of God rules your entire life. Everything that you have, all of your talents, all of your abilities, all of your time, all of your money, it is for the kingdom. But Jesus is even going further. Listen, he's saying all that you dream about, all that you desire, all in which you find satisfaction must be under this thing called the kingdom of God. Now, when we talk about the kingdom, we must understand who is the king over the kingdom, and the king is Jesus. And when we talk about Jesus and how he calls us to follow him, he says it's all or nothing. Let me just give some examples from one particular passage. It's found in Luke chapter 9. So in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is teaching the people, and then he says these stark words. He says, look, if anyone's going to follow me, some of you know how it goes, if anyone's going to follow me, they first must, what, deny themselves then take up their cross and follow me. Basically, Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, it's all for me. And you must be willing to die to yourself. In that same chapter, uh, Jesus says to a man, follow me. And the man says, well, first let me bury my father. And then Jesus gives this statement, let the dead bury their dead. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So I'm not even supposed to care for my family. And Jesus is saying, yes, I have primacy over all things. And then there is a man and he says, look, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. And then Jesus has another famous Jesusism saying, no one can put their hand to the plow and then look back and still be fit for the kingdom. Jesus really said those things. And what he's saying is, the cost is great. If you're going to follow Jesus and be under his kingdom, all must be for that kingdom. Everything that you have. Let's talk a little bit about what I call American Christianity. So in American Christianity, often what we find is we pick and choose what we like about Jesus. Uh, a different way to think about it is what we call conditional cost. I will obey Jesus if. I will obey Jesus when. Let me give some examples. First, let me go big, so cultural, like a cultural Christianity. Today, people will say things like this. You know, I believe that Jesus is king, 
Some of you are aware that Kanye West just came out with an album, which I think is entitled Jesus is King. And so people might say, you know what? I'm like Kanye. I believe Jesus is King. But please don't say that he's the only way. Other religions are cool too. You see, we don't want the cost of reputation that people might think we're incredibly narrow if we believe that Jesus is the only way because he's the only king. Let me give a cultural example, number two. You know what? I really like the teachings of Jesus. He's all about love, but don't expect me to follow his sexual ethic. That's way too restrictive. And so there, the cost is obedience. I don't want to obey everything. I want to have my own life, my own dominion. Let's narrow in on the church. Here's some things that I hear. I know Jesus calls me to forgive, so I will forgive. But I'm still going to be cold in my heart because I want to make that person pay. See, the cost is I don't want to give up being the judge. I want to be the judge. I know Jesus calls me to radical generosity, so I'm going to give. But I'm only going to give when I think I have some left over to give. And so the cost is control. I will give on my terms, not the king's terms. Another thing that I heard, please focus more on teaching the Bible and prayer. In other words, just tell me more to read the Bible and tell me more to pray, but please stop telling me to talk to my neighbors about Jesus and please stop talking about church planting. Basically, the person is saying, you know what, I can read and I can pray more but I do not want to talk to others about Jesus. I'm just too afraid. And so the cost is actually my will. I want to do what I want to do. So have you ever said, I will follow Jesus as king if? The moment we put that if on there, we're basically saying, Jesus, you know what? It's conditional how I follow you. It's like we're trying to bargain with God as though he were a mere merchant <laughs> and that he's not the creator and that he is not the judge of the whole universe. When Jesus says that he is the king, he is saying, I am the king over all, and we cannot make him small as though he is not the infinite, eternal, unchanging God who is holy. <laughs> Jesus is the king and there is nothing to withhold. All is from him. All is his. All is due to him. He is the king. And so he's not just asking for some money. He's asking for your time. He's asking for your talents. He's asking for your reputation. He's asking for your dreams. All that you have is his. Now, some of you might be saying, this is crazy talk. <laughs> if you're visiting, you might be thinking, what a weird church. <laughs> I want to put before you, I'm glad you're saying that, because this is crazy talk. You know what? If we don't see the cost of the kingdom, we're going to actually minimize what the kingdom's all about. If we start to make small what Jesus is saying, we're actually lacking the truthfulness of what he's actually asking. Now, others of us were actually saying, you know what? I'm all in. I'm already there. Caution. You know, that is so easy to say, but it is so difficult to do. Have you sold everything? Are you making any excuses for any sins? Are you really daydreaming about the kingdom of God at all times? See, we can say that we're all in, but you know what? We're still falling short. We don't really just do these things today. And so we look at this cost and we say this cost is impossible. So what do we do? And that's our third point, the currency of the kingdom. One way to give your whole life to Jesus and his kingdom is this, to see that he gave his whole life to you. When Jesus went to the cross, he gave his literal life. He said, I'm going to give my life so that you can have life, life abundant and life eternal. So one way to kind of say, I'm going to give my whole life is to see Jesus giving his whole life for me. Uh, the only way to sell all that you would have for Jesus and his kingdom is to see that he sold all that he has for you. 
I don't know if you saw it, but in our assurance, it's a quote from uh, 2 Corinthians 8. Though he was rich, Jesus was rich. How rich was Jesus? Everything. <laughs> Though he was rich, he became poor so that we might have all in him. Jesus sold everything. The only way to be all in for Jesus and his kingdom is to see how he is all in for you. One of the wonderful places in uh, Go John's gospel is in chapter 6. There it says, Jesus says, you know what, guess what my food is? My food is to do the will of the Father. That's amazing. Jesus is basically saying, you know what gives me sustenance, what gives me energy, what gives me purpose, what gives me drive is to do my Father's will. And when he's getting ready to die upon the cross, he says, guess what? Father, all that you've given me to save, I've got them. I've got them. Jesus is all in for you. That's why he came. The only way to remove conditionality of following him is to see how he has unconditionally loved you. He doesn't wait for us to get our acts together. He doesn't wait for us to give enough. He doesn't wait for us to do more. While we were yet sinners... Jesus died for me, for you. Now, this love, this sacrifice, this cost of Jesus is what we call grace. And grace is free. It's unmerited. And grace is the currency. I put it in different terms. It's the, the motive, the fuel for seeking God's kingdom with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, someone might hear, might say, you know what, wait. This sounds really good, and preacher, you're being kind of motivating today. Um, but what you call grace, couldn't that actually be called guilt? Um, in other words, you see all that Jesus is doing for you, and you're serving in return because you feel like you're obligated to him. You're serving in return because you feel like you owe him something. You want to serve that kingdom kind of like a payback. You ever experience the guilt of a mom? <laughs> you ever get a phone call like this, particularly if you're a son? Uh, will you come over and fix my bathroom sink? And, you know, I get this phone call and I'm thinking about it. I'm just thinking about it. I'm trying to think through my calendar to see if this can actually happen and then immediately the mom starts to say remember all that I did to bring you into the world remember how you were such a difficult baby and when I and you don't want to hear the rest of it and so what do you do you interrupt and you don't care about your calendar and you say mom I'll be there in five minutes you know what you love your mom you want to obey your mom because she is your mom but you're not obeying because of the grace that she is showing you. You're doing it because you feel guilty. You know what, if you don't fix the bathroom sink, you're just gonna feel like you're being nagged and you're gonna feel like you're not accepted before your mom. And so someone might say, you know what, maybe this is what obedience to Jesus is all about. Maybe selling all for the kingdom is just like a payback for grace. Perhaps God is trying to guilt us into serving him. There's a key word in these parables that we need to see. Listen, that word is joy. It's a word that makes us smile. And let's look at that verse 44. We need to point out where joy is placed in that first parable. Look what it says. In joy he goes and sells all that he has, and then he buys the field. Listen, the joy is not that he got a good deal. The joy is not he's a shrewd businessman. The joy is that he discovered the ultimate treasure. That's the joy. What he had been searching for all his life, he has now found. And so he is undone with joy. And Jesus is saying, that is our joy over the kingdom. Jesus and his kingdom is what fulfills us, is what satisfies us. Listen, it what makes us happy. And so we're not pursuing the kingdom as a payback because the kingdom is a free gift. It's not earned or deserved. We're not giving all that we have out of guilt. Instead, we give because we long 
to see the kingdom coming here in Waukesha County and even throughout the world. Now, someone might be saying, how do I get that joy then? How do I long for the kingdom the way that you've just described? You need to see the joy and longing of God over you. Our God longs for us. In Genesis, going back to the very beginning, in Genesis 1 through 3, it tells this wonderful story how God created all things by speaking. And then the pinnacle of his creation is Adam. And so he creates Adam and then he creates Eve and then he says, It is very good. Why is it very good? You know, science looks at us as humans and says, You know what? Science just calls us um, the sentient biped. <laughs> In other words, we are thinking animals. But the Bible gives a completely different picture. The Bible says that we were created in God's image. We are made to know God, to enjoy God, to fellowship with God. In fact, it says God is saying, you are my treasure. Now in Genesis, we see that they walked in the garden together. They enjoyed, they treasured one another. And yet, Adam walked away. They wanted to become their own gods. And right away in Genesis, God promises, you know what? I can't stand this. My joy for you is that you must be with me. And so God promises a redeemer. And we see that promise right away of the Lord Jesus who will come to buy us back. One of the passages that we read um, for our Old Testament reading, there it's talking about what the Jews were supposed to do when they call, came into the promised land. And it's interesting, they were to tie the portion of what they brought in. And they had this wonderful, just wonderful, like, phraseology. And they're like saying, look, we are the sons and daughters of that wandering Aramean, Abraham. We had nothing, and yet, God, you have given us all things. You have even given us this country because you treasure us. We are your joy, and look how you've given to us. And so in return, they now give back to their God. One of the passages um, in Deuteronomy, again in the Old Testament, there's this, again, this time where God is speaking to the people, and he says, you know what? I didn't choose you because you're the most faithful. I didn't choose you because you're the most numerous. I didn't choose you because you're the most popular. I didn't choose you because you're the most strongest. In fact, you're the least I chose you because you are my, and the Hebrew word is segula. It means treasured possession. God says, I chose you because you are my treasure. You are what I want more than anything in this world that I've created. And then we get to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12. It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame, on our behalf. I just want you to hear that. With joy, Jesus went to the cross. With joy, Jesus suffered the curse. With joy, Jesus suffered the pains of hell on our behalf. With joy. What was the joy? That you would be saved and be with him forever and ever. The joy is that you are his treasure. And this joy over God's grace now is the fuel for us to pursue the kingdom at all costs. So we begin to see joy, God's joy over us, and then that joy starts to help us to see things. In joy, we realize that though the cost of the kingdom is everything, I gain everything through Jesus. In other words, I can lose everything in this world and yet have everything because I'm found in Christ. And that's not just a church talk thing, it's a reality. With joy, no longer do the things of this earth, the things that are passing, the things that are fading, no longer do they hold such a tight grip on me. I start to realize that those things are to be used for an ultimate kingdom, the kingdom of God. With joy, I can begin to evaluate myself, my time, my finances, my dreams, and I can say, God, what is it that you're asking of me? I doubt very much that he's going to ask any of you to sell everything, but he might. In the New Testament, we actually do not see any recorded instance of where someone sold everything. 
But we do see instances of where they're selling some things and out of generosity, giving to the kingdom of God. What we're saying here is, will you listen to the Holy Spirit? Spirit, what are you saying for me to build your kingdom? So it's not quite a money sermon. Now we're going to talk about the church deficit during the congregational meeting. This is a kingdom sermon. Will you give all things for it? Will you give your money? Will you give your time? Will you give your heart? Will you give dreams? In regard to money, some of you are withholding the tithe out of fear. You know, it's interesting. God says this is the one area where you can test him. He says, tithe and see if I do not provide for all that you need. How about your time? Some of us say, you know what? I want to serve, but now is not the right time because I don't have any time. The reality is that we make time for what we want to do. And so would you make time to serve his kingdom? How about our hearts? I get it. We're a church that's in transition. I totally get that. And so we're looking at Cornerstone, and I put before you, it is worth investing in because this is a kingdom work. Is it perfected? By no means. We are a work in progress, and it is worth investing in. And how about your dreams? Do you long for the kingdom to come in Waukesha County? Will you pray toward that end? Will you say, God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Jesus is our treasure. Let us seek his kingdom at all costs. Pray with me. <clears throat> Excuse me, God, Father, your word says that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, you gave what was most precious to you, your son, in order to get us. We simply say thank you. We are grateful for your grace. Give us joy over our salvation. In joy, may we seek your kingdom with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And with joy, may we become radically generous with our time, with our money, with our talents. And may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven because your kingdom is the best. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and bring your kingdom. We pray in your name. Amen and amen.